Welcome to the Star of Brian. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our friend, Rami Assad! It's an honor to be here. I've been to a, a bunch of startup grinds, and I, I remember the tradition. And I thought it was silly and goofy when I was, you know, on, on that side. But I got to say, thank you. That that really does feel awesome <laughs> to, to walk into that. <laughs> so, I mean, is it true you uh, you you flew out here just to come out here, and then only to fly back? Yeah. So uh, originally, I was going to be here for a week, and uh, we we have a lot going on at the company, so I, I wasn't able to be here. And yeah. um, but I, you know, we had the schedule then. Uh, Flew out here on uh, on Sunday and flying back tomorrow, so it's uh, it's exciting. So, I mean, I mean seriously, I think you're the first speaker who said I'm gonna fly out here just to go to a Starbucks Grand event. And I was like, man, this guy rocks. I mean, so, it, like, it, it helps that I have an office here and an employee. I mean, there's right. ancillary reasons, but sure, but sure. yeah, it's it, it, you know it's it's uh, definitely worthwhile being out. Sure, cool. So we always like to start out on a personal note. Um, where are you born? Where you raised? What did your parents do? And then uh, talk about your first entrepreneur experience, you know, as a child. So let's start with you. Um, so I was born in Damascus, Syria. Um, my family moved, immigrated over to the U.S. when I was in second grade. Grew up in North Carolina. Um, come from generations of engineers. That, that was my dad's grandfather. Like building things was always uh, a family thing. Um, so when you know, originally I was I studied computer engineering and. Um, when I went into sales and marketing, my dad was just very confused because I wasn't building things anymore. Uh, and he was not, ha not happy with me, but um, it, you know, he, he came around when I started building companies, so that, mm -hmm. was, that was okay for him. Uh, and, and entrepreneurial experience early on, you know, I, I feel like it was just genetic or something. I, I, early on, I, was, I, was, I remember I uh, used to go back to Syria before the turmoil, before everything um, really you know, got... got Went to shit, really. Uh, <laughs> Beep. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but before the the country um, uh, went down this path, I used to go back and visit family. And um, I remember I, I was in seventh grade, sixth grade, and, and went back and saw a shoe shine kit that, that I'd never seen in the U.S. It was just everybody there used this one shoe shine kit. And I convinced my parents. I was like, this is going to be huge in the U.S. I was I was a kid, you know. I was like, and so I convinced them to buy a suitcase full of them and bring it back. And I was, I was <laughs> determined that this was gonna be the next big product. I went door to door to like every single Harris Teeter, every single gas station to, to sell the shoe shine kit. Um, and I was gonna like start import export shoe shine kits. Um, I, I didn't sell a single one. Okay. I think we still have the shoe shine kits, but like, I didn't realize that's not how supply and demand and, and inventory works at, at big <laughs> chains. But um, I, I still had that like urge in me, I always did. Cool, I mean, um... Do you, do you still have family back in Syria? Yeah, I do. You do? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you, you, like you said, you immigrated when you were in second grade. Um, I mean, your family left Syria because of the um, uh, al-Assad regime, right? Yeah. So what's your p opinion about it? I mean, so this, this, is, this is what's nice about sort of like Starve Grind and being a successful entrepreneur. You can now sort of, you know, use this platform to sort of, you know, uh, project your opinion. What is your opinion about this whole thing with, with Syria now? You know, it, it's just it's just a lot of sadness. Yeah. Um, there, the, I, I think the, the the overarching issue is that th there's no end in sight. Mm -hmm. There, there's no finish line that, that anybody can point to and say, I, I wish this would happen. Yeah. Um, and and you know, on a personal note, on from you know a, a, an individual level, I, I I you know ask people and 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 personally you know try to contribute to refugees and ask people to support refugees. But, but on a macro level, I think the world needs to come together and agree on, we, we need to figure out a, a, an end, right? There, there's four, five, six million people displaced, but there's still 20 million people in the country. And, and it's, it's a country in, in, in turmoil. Um, it, but, you know, nobody can agree on whether Assad should stay in power or not or what happens. I mean, my, my family hates him, right? That's yeah. why we left the country. We, yeah. um, but... The, at the same time, there, there's no alternative, and there's there's no there's there's no good outcome, and I think that's the the, the really big struggle that I have. 
So hopefully after your IPO, you can probably set a fund up and maybe start start help, helping people out. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I if, mean, if I had better ideas, it's really yeah. sad. I mean, I, you know, really like our prayers go out to these Syrian refugees, and so we just hope that they can resolve it sooner than later. So yeah. just wanted to see your opinion. So thank you for that. Um, hashtag stop grind at Rami Assad, right? Yeah. So oh, by the way, uh, whoever tweets out the most, you guys are giving out free T-shirts. Yeah, I, I guess I think my guys brought, yeah. brought so, some shirts. So I think there's about 20 people in the room. <laughs> so if you guys all like tweet, then you'll get a t-shirt. So there's only 20. So make sure you tweet out. Hashtag stop Ryan, uh, add Rami Assad. So I want to get right into the Distill Network story. Um, let's just go right from the beginning. Like, how did you come up with the idea? Like, what was the aha moment? And, um, you know, how did you meet your co-founder? Let's start from the beginning. Like, how did it all start? Uh, so I was working at a cloud security company, and customers were actually asking for a way to detect web scrapers or, or bots. That's what we do. We identify the difference between a real person and a computer program on your website. So uh, if you've ever filled out the squiggly lines, the CAPTCHAs, um, everybody hates those. But that's people's way of trying to tell if you're a real human or not. We came up with a completely transparent way to do it that's more effective, and it doesn't impact the end user. So really simple problem, that's what we do. I was working at a cloud security company and customers were asking for it. The, the company I worked for didn't wanna, didn't wanna really tackle it and so I, I decided that this was something that is, is worthwhile. Um, and I pinged some lifelong friends, people I've known since second grade, or seventh grade rather. Um, and, and we started working on it, moonlighting on it together. I mean, wouldn't you say, I mean, there's this term called intrapreneur that we hear a lot. Uh, you know, some of the past speakers that we've uh, interviewed, Capital One, Cvent, these were all entrepreneurs who had the idea. The, the idea was actually conceived while they were working at their big company. Yours is the same thing, right? I yeah. mean, it, it started there. And so when you, again, like this was sort of like, hey, this is niche. How come they're not, how come they're not fixing this? Or, how, you know, and so we're going to build it ourselves. You were building it. Like, how long did it take you to build this? So we, we started, you know, at the beginning of 2011, I spent about six months while still working there. And then um, I, you know, when we had a, a, a prototype where some people were playing around with it and, and, and gave us positive feedback, I, I actually left the job and, you know, decided that, hey, I'm going to do this full time. My co-founders didn't. They, mm -hmm. they were like, you're crazy, but we're, we love you. So we're going to work together. Uh, but when you get some real money, we'll, we'll quit our jobs, too. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, it took us pretty much a year, all, all of 2011, to get the, the MVP going, to get um, customers on our platform, or not customers, but beta, beta testers on our platform. But would you, so this, this is also interesting that you call it MVP, but it really it's a prototype, right? You actually had a working prototype that you were work, that you built this for a year. Just to let you know, this whole bot, this whole bot thing, uh, uh, it basically, it's the culprit, of the, these bots is behind like web, web scraping, brute force attacks, right? Competitive data mining, brownouts, account hijacking, unauthorized vulnerability scans, spam, middle, middle, man in the middle attacks, click fraud, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you and, and that's, you know, the, 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 the summary, but there's a lot more. Bots are a platform. They're, they're just a tool that hackers use to do a lot of bad things. Mm -hmm. So you could do those, which are probably the, the, more nef the most nefarious of it, but there's a lot more too. So when you would don't. create your prototype, what did you, what was the prototype? Because I mean, this is like a whole laundry list of nefarious things that they can do. Like what was the first, what was the first, I won't call it MVP because it was a prototype. What did it do? I mean, so, so the, the, the premise that we came in is don't identify the problem, identify the tool. And that's what nobody else was doing. We, you know, there was a lot of people that were trying to stop brute force login attempts. But, but we, instead of trying to figure out how to stop that, we said, how do we figure out, how do we detect bots other than using CAPTCHA? How can we detect bots? And that's, that's what we started building out. And that's um, once, once we got the, the initial piece that we felt like, hey, we're, ca we're catching the majority of bots that are running across the website. That's when we felt like we had an MVP. Now, mind you, we, we run in line with website traffic. So if we mess up, the customer's site is down. Yeah. Um, and early on, as we were experimenting, there, there were some rough times with, with beta customers. So it was, it was tough and go, like a touch and go for a while. You know, it's like, so I advise a lot of startups. And so uh, one interesting observation I noticed, engineer-led startups versus non-engineer-led startups. What I've noticed is that the non-engineer-led startups, they'll create what they call the MVP 
which in this case, if I if I if they're going to create something like this, they'd be like, well, I'm going to show you a a video, right? That's going to do this, right? And it's it's totally faking till you make it, right? For engine for engineer led startups, you actually created the prototype and actually show, demonstrated that, right? Yeah, I mean that that was the thing we we. We just we didn't even know actually we hadn't even incorporated the company hadn't divvied up shares or anything we just thought let's let's build the the, the stuff let's build okay. the product itself and then once that happens people will just give us money but that that wasn't the case because isn't there a, isn't there sort of a disadvantage for creating that like the first time because you know you 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 build this up for a whole year and then you try to say ta da hey this is what we have how did you guys um, keep that customer feedback that the feedback loop. To tweak the the product, did you have to tweak it a lot? Like, yeah, I mean, you... it was it was a constant iteration. These guys had such a big problem with bots that they were willing to play with our software and risk downtime to their site, risk things not working out. They they were they were really really patient with us, um, but because they had a, a big problem. So um, you know, I, I remember times when um, our software would crash and I would be driving. And I would literally either pull open my laptop as I'm driving, if I'm sitting in traffic, or pull off to the side of the road and, and restart things just to get their site back up. Because I was getting texts that were like, "Hey, our site's down. What, what did you do now?" Right? So like, it was they were very, very patient, but they worked with us because they had that, that big enough problem. Great. Um, hashtag start of grind at Rami Assad. Let's talk about when you got into tech stars because this is. This is where this is what got what got me interested, right? In distilled network. I mean, there's there's tons of startups that we could highlight, but this whole like tech stars and get having them get you involved, you know, they invest in you and then they accelerated you, and then that sort of led the the whole path of success to finally Bessemer. But talk about like, you know, how did you how did you get tech stars to be interested in you, right? Like what? What did you, you just want? You applied on their website, and then they just return your call and say, "Hey, come in." Or how? How did that whole process work? Yeah, we we actually applied on a fluke. We we didn't even know what TechStars was when we applied. I got this random email that said, "You know, if you're building a cloud company, apply for TechStars Cloud." And I thought, you know, I like winning things, so why not? Um, and so we just applied, like cut and paste the application, and and just submitted it. Um, we were. Tr I was trying to raise money because, again, I had quit my job, mm -hmm. uh, put all my money into into the company, and I was sleeping on my co-founders' couches mm -hmm. while they had a nine to five. Right? They were moonlighting on this, but they, you know, they weren't as crazy as I was. So I needed to raise money to be able to to get them to to quit. So um, the the turning point for us was we got selected down to the top twenty five, and when we get we got to that point. And I was, I was talking to all these investors, and I finally said, hey, well, I just casually mentioned it. Well, and we're also top 25 for, for getting into tech stars, and that got them all interested. Um, and I realized, okay, this is something, and we, we put a lot more effort into getting them to, to agree to us. We were actually, our application was so bad, we were company 11 out of 10. They like kind of just squeezed us, squeezed us in over the bubble. So you had mentioned before that um, CIT fund were interested, well, they, you did pitch to them because yep. how many how many investors did you pitch to by the way? I, you know, I had talked to dozens. I would, you know, okay, I, dozens. Okay, yeah. at that time. Okay, good. So then CIT were interested, and yeah. they didn't want they they didn't want to invest in you, right? I mean, they were you know they they were interested. There was a couple of people interested, um, but but it wasn't there was no catalyst. There was nothing right. like driving them to say, okay, here's a check. Okay, and then what happened? So after you guys got into TechStars, yeah. So we like, got into TechStars, and I said, hey, we're leaving in a month to yeah. go you know, to this program and, and CIT wrote a check, right? Okay. They were like, okay, well, we want you to come back. So here, here's, you know, $200,000. And so that's, that's, I guess that's, that's sort of the moral of the story is like, you know, is your startup good enough to get into a tech stars? Cause the thing is about tech stars folks is that it's almost to get into tech stars is, is like harder to get into to these top accelerators than it is to get into the Harvard MBA program. Right. Yeah. That's I mean, what that's, I heard that, about these tech. That, yeah. So like you're you're and I'm just trying to say like what state was your startup at that time when you when Techstar says hey we want to invest in you guys like you had a real product yeah we had right? people using it a product and we you know and, the, and then the growth it. rates did you guys have amazing no we had growth? we had no growth okay, okay. Yeah, we had no growth it was it was really centered around the 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 idea of the product of the product itself and and people using it okay so how many of you here think that you guys have a wicked ass product without any customer customers. Okay, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna talk to him right afterwards. 
I mean, I mean, honestly, this is this is what this startup is all about. It's like you have to create a product that can stand on its own legs, right? And you know, of course, the the customer acquisition and all that stuff is going to come later. But if it's not good enough for tech stars to look at it, like like with you guys, then you guys have to sort of have to rethink rethink your strategy, right? Yeah, I mean, it was it was. It was important for, I mean, the Techstar piece was a, an important validation point for us um, to, to get the, the early stage funds. Um, I, I think, it, it, you know, they invest in companies of all stages. Um, it, it really, it does, it does give you that early stage validation of, hey, you, you've reached a milestone where we think that you're, you can be accelerated, right? You've figured enough out that, hey, we, we're going to help drive you forward, um, which is what money does too, right? So if you think about it in that respect, money is going to help you drive forward, and, and so are they. And that's why those two things kind of went hand in hand for us. Okay. I want to talk about going all in, okay, because you had mentioned that uh, you were all in, but your co-founders, I mean, were sort of like on the side. They had, they're there with their full-time jobs. Yeah. And they're like, hey, I mean, this is a story I always hear all the time. Startups where they have a founder, and then they have their co-founders that are having full-time job. What is your opinion about that? Like you went all in, three other, three other co-founders. Should all co-founders go all in? You know, I, I, I don't blame them, right? One had a family, the other two had, we all had really well-paying jobs. I just, maybe more eccentric than most. It's just, I, I had tried other startups, I had tried other ideas in the past, and, and half, half-assing it just doesn't work. Right, you know, part time at some point you, you really have to dive in, especially if you're trying to raise money, because at the end of the day, if you're not all in, then why would an investor put money behind you? Um, so, so that was kind of the, the big moment when I knew I had to raise money and I knew I, I believed in this. I, I decided to go all in, and I, that was good enough for us. Um, and they, I mean, they worked really hard. They worked at night, you know, weekends. They did work really, really hard. Um, and since I was the face of the company, it worked out. But if, if you need you know, support and going out there and fundraising, then, then you know, anybody going out doing the circuit is going to have to be all in. So I know there's probably startups who are exactly in that situation. And so I want you to let them know what is sort of the implications for that in terms of equity distribution. Because so, obviously, I mean, I would say from your point of view, you probably had a lot more because you had a lot more invested, right? Like vested into the startup. So... I mean, did it reflect the equity distribution? With yeah, the I, mean, I mean, so, so there was a, a lot more personal risk. Um, you know, I, I gave up a, a, a really well-paying job, um, put $60,000 of my own money in, um, you know, it ended up, uh, you know, having, having some personal impact and, and personal relationships with me. So um, there, there was a lot more at risk for me. And so on, on the upside of it, um, I... I the three of them combined had less equity, you know, less than less than half the company, right? Mm -hmm. we, we all agreed it was it was only fair that if, if this takes off, I would own the majority of the company. And that's and this this story is actually kind of interesting because you uh, before you went all in, you had a a pretty posh job, like getting paid more than hundred hundred grand, right? A year? Yeah, I mean yeah. I, was, I was making like one sixty, one seventy. Yeah, yeah, yeah wow. Was... You didn't I, wow, <laughs> shoot, is that job still open? <laughs> Uh, but but basically, when you went all in, I mean, you you didn't have salary for a couple months. Uh, you raised, and then even after you raised, you kept your salary pretty low. Around was it, how, what was your salary? Yeah. So we paid ourselves. We I mean, we we agreed that when we raise money, this is going to be for the growth of the company. So we we all took a cut. Um, even though they quit, you know, well-paying jobs, we all decided to just keep our salaries at sixty k a year, just to you know, bare minimum what we thought we needed to survive go on day to day now was was that your decision to do it not not your uh, your investors yeah i mean to it was, keep your it salaries was, that low yeah it was ours it okay. was, you know we we wanted to be you know thrifty we wanted it to to the, the last thing we wanted to do is just eat up all that money and you know because we had only raised a couple hundred thousand dollars that doesn't go very far mm -hmm. um last thing we wanted to do is eat it up in six months and then go back to work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah ramen noodles you know doesn't <laughs> taste that great you know once you're making a lot more money um <laughs> So you, you raised uh, 1.5 seed from FF Ventures, um, Techstars, uh, CIT, and then uh, Series A Foundry with mm -hmm. Brad Feld's uh, fund, and then finally Bessemer with Series B with 3.1 million. Yeah. I mean, 30, 31 point, 31, 31, 31 million, not yeah. 31 point, 31 million. So um, 
I know I'm fast forwarding really quick here, but like, how did you, how were you able to get Bessemer to invest in you? You know, that round? so I mean, after Techstars, are. before our seed, uh, we pitched a lot of people and I, I got like a hundred no's before FFVC gave us the, the first million, you know, in some change. Um, and we were able to, to, to turn that into uh, actual customers. We, we took that and started getting traction, getting, getting customers, and we had a really, really good growth rate. We did an inside round again with FFVC, and then in 2014, we, we went out to fundraise again, and I took all the, the 100 people that had said no to me for our seed round and just emailed them again and said, hey, here we are a year, a year and a half later, and we've gone from nothing to you know, well over a million run rate, and everything's going well. What do you guys, you know, how, how about now? Um, and that, that got a lot more people excited. And so I had a bunch of competing term sheets, took a, a $10 million Series A round from Foundry. Um, but Bessemer was part of the people that I emailed, but they didn't move fast enough. And so when it, you know, a year later, that this year, when we were, you know, kind of, we hadn't even decided to, to fundraise, they just came to us and said, Hey, you're, it's about time. It's more than about a year since you, you did it last time. When are you going to go fundraise? And I said, hey, maybe in Q3, Q4 this year. And they, you know, they just preempted it. They asked us what we wanted, and they gave it to us. See, and so you know, Bessemer is probably one of the most well-respected VCs in the valley, and it's like they're waiting at the door, which is like, you know, I, I don't know if people in the audience <laughs> realize how like crazy that is, right? Having a Bessemer waiting and say, oh you know, we'd like to participate in your next round, right? And you didn't even have to make an announcement, right? Yeah, I mean, we didn't go out and fundraise. Yeah, because um, they were already there. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's definitely a, a blessed position to be in. I think um, the venture space right now is a really weird space. If it, There's the, the hyper-growth companies that just, you could just have your pick. Um, and, and we were lucky enough to, to be one of those. And then literally anything outside of hyper-growth, you're actually having a hard time fundraising out in, in, the, in the marketplace. Um, people, I think investors view, uh, people, people from the outside view venture right now is just crazy. Like, oh, you know, caution to the wind. What, what I actually think about it is people look at hyper-growth as a safe bet. And so venture is actually more cautious now than, than maybe they were a couple of years ago. Um, because they're taking less risks on non-hypergrowth companies. Um, they know that markets are giving great returns to hypergrowth companies, so that's, that's where we're, we kind of are in, in that space. So um, we, we could have gone to, to just about anybody, and people were actually mad at me that I didn't go out and fundraise because they thought that they would have a shot at our no. B round. That's a, that's a great problem it's, to have. It's, a, not, it's not a bad it's problem to have. I, I'll so take it any day versus having that. Do you still have that email that you sent out to your to 100 you know, investors? I, I don't have the email, but I, I mean, I, I kept a spreadsheet. We'd love to cut and paste that and send it out to 100 investors, <laughs> too. What, was, what sort of things did you highlight? So, I mean, obviously, the growth rate, that was probably one of the big highlights, the metrics that the people were um, interested in. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the what, growth what, what, rate. What was, what was the growth rate? So, we, we were doing 10 to 20% month-over-month month growth in terms of revenue. Um, so, you know, double-digit monthly, re you know, monthly revenue growth. That, that, you know, just to give you guys an idea of scale, you, you in, in, we went from nothing to a million dollars in one year, um, about four million dollars um, the next year, and, and you know about twelve this year. You know it ends up being about three, four hundred percent year over year growth, which is you know hard to hard That's to keep revenues, up. right? Yeah, revenue, okay. right? And and you know with that that means customers and and, and et cetera. So um, it was traction on revenue, but it also was um, the the types of customers that that really got people excited. The names got bigger and bigger. Actually, no. That that was that was my next question about this whole customer acquisition. So, the metrics that you were using uh, acquiring customers, you know, were you looking at the daily actives versus month? You know how they do that Dow Mal daily actives over monthly actives. What was sort of the important metrics you were looking at? You know, I, I know for customer acquisition, it's always like the activations, the retentions, it's the referrals, and the revenue, right? Yeah. Big R. Were you guys looking at that? For yeah. So, I mean, the, the metrics that, you know, Bessemer has, is very metric driven. So, when we did our latest round, um, they, they dug into customer acquisition costs, they dug into churn. Um, that, that's a big one. Churn is, is a really so big one. So, what numbers indicator. are they looking for for churn? Like, I, I don't know what the, I, I think monthly under 1% is good. We, we were, you know, less than a third of that. We, I mean, annually wow. we, we, we lost very, very few customers, right? Okay. Good uh, retention. Yeah. Good retention. Yeah. yeah. 
um, you know, growth, growth is great, but if you lose customers as fast as you get them, or, then, then that's not sustainable. Um, the, the other things that they look for, are, you know, we talked about, I, I say customer acquisition costs, CAC, how much... CAC ratio, yeah. yeah. How much it costs you to, um, to, to get a customer, to get a dollar of revenue versus how much you spend. Um, you, you know, a, a lot of different um, baseline SaaS metrics that they look at. No, none of the user acquisition costs, cause, or none of the user acquisition numbers just because we're, we're B2B, not, not consumer. How, how many of you here are... Um... Uh, uh, SaaS, SaaS startup, SaaS software as a soft, a software as a service. Okay, so um, Bessemer is. I mean, they they're really really big on CAC ratio. So all those who don't know what CAC ratio, I mean, I've I've actually talked about this in the last two uh, fireside chats, huh. and uh, the companies that you know with fiscal notes, those guys were like crazy CAC ratio. But CAC ratio, all it really is is. It's, it's your gross margin, so it's like your revenues minus cost of goods sold uh, over divided by your sales and marketing cost. So in other words, what it means is, right, and it's on the Bessemer website, by the way, all it means is that um, if, it's, um, if it goes up, this CAC ratio goes up, then that means you're growing really fast and your marketing has to catch up with it. So the ratio they say is uh, if the CAC ratio is above or close to one, invest more aggressively in acceler and accelerate growth if capital is available, right? Yeah. You guys are obviously above one, right? Yeah. 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 Um, and then, then, but they say that if it's lower than 0 0.3, uh, it's time to slam on the brakes, focus on sales and marketing, you know, focus on sales and marketing. Uh, you know, your sales and marketing plan really sucks. And if your ratio is between 0 0.3 and 1, you know, stick with your plan, you know, find other ways to make your startup leaner. So it's the cost. Yeah. So I thought that, I thought that was kind of interesting because Bessemer is, like I said, they, they're very big on that and it's all over their website. Um, let's talk about uh, hiring, talent acquisition. Uh, what, do you have any tips uh, when you hire? I think, um, I mean, we haven't had, we've had one person quit at, at the still. We're, you know, 90 people. It, um, so it you hired something. 90 people and noise quit. Yeah, uh, and the, the only reason he quit is because he 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 did he wanted to do stand up comedy, um, <laughs> and and so I, I can't do anything about that. Um, stand up comedy when he looks at his checkbook. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he may be back, so but crying. Um, I, I you know I, I was lucky enough to start the company with friends, um, best friends, guys I've known my whole life, and then we hired a couple more friends, um, and so early on we had this culture of. Just honesty, like transparency, like the way you are with your family, the way you are with your best friends. And then um, as we started hiring more people, at first it started being like the haves and the have-nots. You know, you had the, the guys that I, I would be completely honest with and then everybody else. And I realized that that just wasn't going to work. And so we, we brought everybody into the circle and, and now I have, you know, 90 friends. Um, and, and what that's meant is that everybody, everybody's on the same page, right? Everybody believes in, in what we're doing, but, but trusts the decisions that I make because I'm completely transparent about them. Um, and, and we've tried to build a, a sense of alignment where we're, if we're not moving as a, in lockstep together, then we're at least moving as a herd. So constantly um, you know, cross-team collaboration, constantly talking, um, all hands, bringing everybody together on a very, very regular basis so that um, you know, it's, it's, it's one unit. Um, and I think that's what's allowed us to, to stay strong. But how do you know when a candidate comes in that you're like, this guy has a, he, there's a cultural fit here for our startup? Like, how, like, what are some of the indicators that you look for? I mean, it, does he have to be fans of Star Wars or like, does he have to drink like, you know, Mountain Dew every yeah, we, hour? We, like, have a, we have a mix of different people. I mean, yeah. like, w nobody's quit, but we fired like, you know, a dozen and a half people. So it's not like it's... <laughs> oh, okay, you didn't say that. I mean, okay. I, right. I mean they, but, but that happens, right? You, you, yeah, yeah. You know, whether it's, it's for the, you know, a, a wrong culture fit or, you know, that somebody's not right for the, the certain position. I mean, early on when it was just, when it was four of us, we parted ways with a co-founder yeah. because the, the investors felt like he wasn't the right fit. Um, so, so you have to make those, those really, really hard decisions um, when somebody's not the right fit, but you have to, you have to act on them and you, you have to do... You just got to cut it out quick. So when do you realize that you have to fire somebody? Like how long do you give them? Or what sort of like, 
what sort of bells and whistles do you guys put in place to say, hey, this is your first warning or whatever it may be? What, how do you like deal with that? I mean, if, if for us, if you're ever not excited about being there, if, if you just don't, if, if this is a job, if this is check in, check out, like you're gone instantly. There, there's just no reason for you to be there. Um, but, but outside of that, if, if you're maybe not, you're, you're, the role we hired you for is not the right role, then, then we, we try to work with you to, to adjust you know, the, your, your skill set. We, we, we tell you what the expectations are. We, we work with you on, on getting you there. Um, but if, if you still can't get there, then you know, two, three months, then it, it just, it's not the right fit. And how do you guys uh, figure out salaries? I mean, obviously in startups, there's always like, there's like, it's more art than science, but you know, you always have to be below like market rate. And I'm kind of curious, like, do you have like certain percentage, like, you know, 20, 30, and then try to compensate that with stock options? Like, what is your, what's your, I mean, formula? it changed over time. When we had, when we raised a million dollars, uh, we were really below market rate. Like, you know, you take median market rate and we, we try to be like 40% under that, wow. 30, 40% under that. But, but we compensated that with really heavy stock options. Um, and then as, as we got more and more funding, we, we tried to get, to get closer and closer. We'd like to think that we're in, in kind of the median market rate right now, um, where, where we're competitive, you know, on, on the middle ground. We, we don't want to, we don't ever want anybody to come to us for the, for a salary, right? If you, if you're, if you want to switch jobs to, to get more money, then it's not the right fit for you, for us. So how do you figure out the, the whole, st okay, so again, like, you know, hey, if there's a, if there's, you minus here, you're going to have to compensate here, right? So stock options, how do you figure that out? Like, do you reverse engineer, like, how it looked like in 10 years, and let's see how much we have to give them and allocate in stock options? Like, what is it? Yeah, you know, I, I, a lot of people concentrate on a certain percentage of the company where I, I think it's a flawed approach. Uh, you know, you, you hear about, oh, you should give an engineer 25, you know, 0.25 of a percent, or you should give, you know, a salesperson this percent. I, I don't buy that because every company is going to have a different outcome, mm -hmm. right? And if, if you genuinely believe that this is the outcome that you're shooting for, then, then you work backwards on what an upside should be. So early stage, early stage employees, we wanted to make sure that we got them all to seven figures. And so we worked backwards on numbers and we said, hey, this is what seven figures should look like. So how long though? Like what's that time frame? So because seven year, uh, seven figures, I mean, that could be like that could be like in 10 years or I mean, know, it, could, it could be we, five years. Right. Like, I mean, it, it, you know, our, our timeline was was, um, you know, five to eight years. OK. Uh, um, and we're, we've stuck to it. Right. Okay. We've we've stuck to that um, to, to kind of that timeline. So right now we're, you know, on on what we think is, a, is an IBO path in, in three to five years, right? So um, that's, that's been our, our trajectory and, and it's worked out. Okay, great. Um, so a typical engineer, I mean, how, how much, uh, are you guys hiring by the way? <laughs> <laughs> We've got an engineer we are, we have a, a yeah, we're, we're adding. What does that package look like for an engineer? <laughs> I don't know, maybe a sales engineer type person. Yeah, I mean, it, it really From depends Carnegie on Mellon, <laughs> position of position. Brand. Yeah, it, it, um, and and really the, the 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 type of position, and you know, now we're an engineer should get a, a comfortable six figure exit, you know, in, in three to five years. So that's the upside, and then you're going to get a, a median market salary, okay, and a lot of fun benefits. Um, so let's talk about the future of Distill. Like, uh, you know, when you guys gonna go IPO? Yeah, we think three to five years. That's the goal. Really? Yeah. So you got open positions. I'm trying to. Um, and then who would be the perfect like acquirer? If you, I mean, if you're gonna go, if you're not gonna go IPO, then who would be the perfect company to acquire you guys? I mean, we're, we're trying to avoid that, but I mean, the Cisco's, the F5s, the uh, uh, Impervas, a lot of the security companies that that are doing web security right now, um, we we play very well with with their product set. Okay, great. Um, and so I want to shift gears here a little bit uh, because we always like to talk about this, especially for startups that are here in DC. But I want to talk about DC Tech. Um, so why did you decide to stay in DC? I mean, you could have, it's a lot, you know, like a lot of uh, investors will say, hey, pick up your bags and then completely move the company somewhere else. Like, why did you decide to stay here in DC? I know it's kind of an obvious question, but I want to hear your answer. Well, I mean, we, so we split the company last year. We, we, moved some of us out to San Francisco to open up uh, an office out there. But we decided to keep a, a strong presence in D.C. One, because we didn't want to uproot 
everybody that was here, but but there's also a you know the benefits of of being um, you know close to government. We don't sell in the government now, but we knew we wanted to, so that would be that was going to be helpful. Um, talent here is cheaper and more loyal. Um, okay, what does that mean though? So when they're more loyal, like what I mean, I, mean, I, I just don't. Were you unique as a company here? Um, in that you know you, you come in and when you know whenever you want you you come in in shorts and flip flops you have you know games all around the office and and snacks and lunches provided for you in Silicon Valley we're we're a dime a dozen um, th those kinds of that's table stakes um, you know and and everybody really gets very passionate in Silicon Valley about their job um, here a lot of people go to work because they have to, not because they're passionate about their company. Our employees are, are passionate about us. So um, that, that means that we haven't had a single person quit, whereas in, in Silicon Valley, most people, most companies, they see an engineer churn every 12 months. That's the average, that's the average age for, for an engineer at a company. So do, do you have, I mean, do they tell you like, hey man, I got, I got, a, I got a job offer from well, you know, X, Y, and Z. Do, do, are they always getting job offers? I mean, Is that what you mean we, by we, Yeah, we, we have to fight off recruiters all the time. Okay. Um, so before I open up the Q and A, uh, I want to I want to ask this one last question. Um, so what we always ask this, by the way, what was your biggest mistake, and how did you recover from it? Could be anything. Yeah. So I, the biggest I think mistake for us was early on when I when I founded the company. You, you call it entrepreneur or, or, or whatnot. When I was working at a at a big company, I, I didn't set a set a clear boundary between my startup and, and the the company that I was working for, and that actually came back to bite us. When we were in TechStars, we got sued by my previous company. Um, so if you guys watch Silicon Valley, it, it's quite literally our story. It's it's PTSD for us watching because um, we we could we had term sheets on the table, those dried up. Um, at TechStars, we had to spend six months fighting a lawsuit, um, and we, you know, barely barely made it through. So um, it was it was really rough. And so if I was to do it all again, set a clear differentiation between what you do at work and, and starting a company. So that means that we we have to read our employee em, employee agreement. <laughs> yeah, I mean, every, well, what should we be looking for? Is the most question? people have signed an IP assignment clause, and that's what they got me with. Is that it's a piece of paper you you just innocuously sign, and it says anything that you think of, quite literally anything you think of, belongs to us. Um, and, and they're very broad, and in Virginia they can be. Um, and so, but but in that there's a disclosure sheet where you can say I'm working on X, and this is outside of work. Um, go back if you start something while you're there. Go back and and go back to HR and fill it in and make them aware of what you're doing outside of work. At the same time, um, separate work resources from, from this. I, I use my work laptop, shouldn't have done that. Um, you, you, you know, I, I worked from home, so there was not a clear differentiation between when I was working on the company, on my, on my company, and when I was working for the company, right? I, I worked for the company at night, so I thought I could work on my stuff during the day sometimes, it's not that that black and white, but that's but that's kind of hard to do because like you know, I mean in other words, you're saying full disclosure. Try to be as transparent to your employer as much as you can if you're working on side jobs, right? Is that what? You're yeah, saying? yeah. Full disclosure and, and okay, so separation. Yeah. Are you guys, do you guys? Are, I mean, there's tons of entrepreneurs here, and it who may are not come back to bite everybody. I'm sure like a lot of people get away with it, um, but it almost killed us. So it it, it happens. Wow. Okay. It's amazing. Um, so we'd like to open the floor up for Q and A. By the way, what I'm sorry, what positions are you guys looking for now? I, I mean, we're hiring sales engineers. We're hiring sales engineers. Um, I, I think we just filled the recruiting position, office manager, all, all sorts of stuff. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, we'll have them talk to you afterwards, or maybe you yeah, can tell just, them who to talk to. Yeah, just slash jobs is, is everything, and you know, project managers, you you name it. We're we're growing at a it's hard to keep up with, with how many positions we have open. Okay. All right. So we're going to open up the uh, venue for questions. Um, what, do you, what do you think was the most valuable uh, skill you acquired uh, to help you succeed as an entrepreneur? I, I think it was hustling. Right? I, I, just always, I, I always hustled. And, and it, it just means doing, doing what it takes to, to kind of get the job done. So... Um, early on when, when we were trying to raise our seed round, 
I, I was getting a lot of no's, so I, I, we, we kept going at it, and we did a million different pitch competitions. Right? We, I had already won, I won the South by Southwest pitch competition, but I would fly out and do pitch competitions in Vegas. I would do them like all over. Anybody, anytime somebody would give me a microphone, I would hustle and try to get, get up there just so that people could hear about what we were doing and people could get excited and people would write about us. And anytime there was a press opportunity, I was always out there. It was just, you know, doing, a, doing whatever it took to, to kind of get attention, get, get out there is, is I think the, the, the biggest asset for us early on. Okay, next question. Let's come up here. If you guys have, any, if you guys have questions, like line up here. <laughs> That'd probably be easier. Here we go. So I'm a computer security person as well, and um, my concern with startup ideas is how do I come up with an idea that can't be essentially reverse engineered and stolen, especially when it comes to web technologies. Like for example, if a, an engineer from like a CDN looks at your technology and says, oh, I see exactly how they're doing this, and now I can replicate it on our end, too, then yeah, what's I, to stop that? I think that's the wrong question. If, if, you're, if your stuff can be reverse engineered that quickly, that easily, um, then, then what's the value in it, right? It's, it's not in the idea. Everybody, there's a million ideas out there. It's, it's really in the execution of it all. Um, it, CDNs have tried to reverse engineer what we do. I tell people what we do. I, I will give you a blueprint of what we do, but I'm confident in how much we've developed so far and how hard that was and the lessons learned and I'm also confident of how fast we're developing towards the future that I know that they can't keep up. Every time I, I pitch a customer or every time we talk to a customer, we tell them exactly how we do it because when they realize that is, is when they realize that how much effort went into creating what we created. You're, you're never going to create a, an idea that's uncopyable, right? And, and it's, it's all in the execution of, of how you implement it. Right? There, there's no magic behind Uber. Right? There's no magic behind any, whether it's consumer tech or even you know, a security company. There's really not a lot of, um, of IP that, that at some point can't be recreated. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's in how you execute it that, that makes the biggest difference. And, and the more distance you can place between what you create and what somebody's going to have to come up with, um, you know, subject matter expertise that, that's going to give you, you know, insight that they may not have off the bat, um, the better. But early on, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be tough. Um, so just don't let them know what you're doing, right? Get, if you find a niche that nobody else is doing, then, then capture that niche as quickly as possible and, and run with it. So would you say that an effective strategy is mostly being first to market and kind of building the momentum and kind of... Yeah, first to market and... and it well, right? You, you, can, you can take two ideas, to, to the exact same idea, um, and, and two companies that are doing it about the same, but, but there's always little nuances in how you execute each individual thing that, that's going to separate one from the other, right? There, there's a million, if you're, if you're you know, in cyber, there's a million load balancers, right? Fundamentally, they, they all do the same thing. They move packets from, from you know, uh, whether it's layer three or layer seven, they move packets from one place to another um, and, and route them and, and fail over. There, there's no feature differences, but the execution and the, the load balancers is what made F5 the market leader versus everybody else fall apart, right? So it, it's the nuances in how you execute that, that idea and, and how well you do it is, is I think, what's going to differentiate you. How important is it to have a technical co when you're first starting out, because there's a lot of sorry, yeah, I mean, sorry. I, I, right? If if you think that I I I mean, it, it, there's there are people that can do it without, right? But um, I've had friends come to me and say, hey, I have this great idea. I'm going to go hire a team to do it. No, like I I wouldn't waste your money personally, right? This is my my two cents. But why? If you can't convince somebody to join you um, to to work on it as, as a co-founder, then you're not going to be able to convince an investor to invest in you. Um, without the, the, th the reason we made it through as far as we did is because I was technical, my two, co two of my co-founders were technical. That's, that's what allowed us to survive. But um, without a technical co-founder, I think you're, you're really uh, swimming upstream. All right, we're going to have to get a question from the cyber security guys, but think about your questions, and then I'll let you get to it. Uh, two questions. First of all, is how are you looking at keeping your company culture with the hyper growth that you're going to be experiencing? A lot of it comes down to um, that, that alignment piece where 
we constantly again get together so uh, you, you bring in the old with the new and, and continue to um, to intermix them so every six months for example we all take a, a, a week-long um, trip somewhere and we we do a, a company all hands right so essentially a, a week where we're not selling we're not doing we're talking about the, the strategy of the company every six months so that we can all be you know on that same alignment every two weeks I, I get on a webinar and I ask and we open it up for Q&A questions where I, I answer honestly to, to the company anything that somebody wants to ask, anywhere from how much money is left in the bank to you know, what keeps me up at night. Um, those, those kinds of things, I think, it helps um, create that alignment, and it brings the, the new people in very, very quickly to, to how we do things at Distill. Okay. Second question is, how many jobs are you guys going to be looking like hiring for this year? I'm a recruiter. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, th this year we're, we're adding maybe 10, 15 more jobs. Um, we, we try to do most of it in-house, just, yeah, just so you know, but. Come on, cybersecurity experts, come on, you have, you have a question? Come up here, day one. By the way, day one is like one of the uh, industry experts. He speaks all over the world, I don't know if you know him. Yeah, yeah you guys met. Okay, here we go. What's your really hard question, day one? Oh, it's going to be actual business question. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, cybersecurity companies based out of the D.C. area, I mean, one thing, we rock. I mean, we produce, I think, the baddest and the best, just, you know, being the nature of what we protect. But there's a challenge, you know, that some of us run. It's like right now me. I'm pure industry focused. I'm not trying to pitch to the government. So I'm going to ask you, when you first started, did you have the challenge of when you're trying to raise money here or talk to the investment community here, were they more government focused Saying like, hey, what's your, you know, what's your plan to pitch to Uncle Sam? Yeah. Uh, I mean, a, a lot of investors here are government focused and, and there's also just a, unfortunately, a, a, a lower amount of capital here than, than maybe other places in the country. Um, that's why outside of CIT and a few smaller funds, um, like people like Militello or, or Dingman Angels, we don't have a lot of DC money in us, right? We've raised 43, 44 million dollars and less than a million of that is, is here in D.C. So um, we had that hard, to, that hard of a time. That's why you know, I, I went out, outside of here. I went to New York and pitched. I went to San Francisco and pitched and d expanded my network beyond what, what local capital is available. I think we have time for one more question. So it better be good. <laughs> here you go. So I, got, I, I just got one quickly about uh, like mentors and the role of like, you know, any sort of stories, you know, when you were coming up that, you know, influenced you about how you were going to, you know, how you were going to put in the grind, so to speak. So the, the question is about mentorship. Yeah, there's, you know, for, for us, I think mentorship was, was huge. Uh, Techstars provided a lot of mentors, people that I'm still in touch with. I, I still lean on the, the, the network that I, uh, I built out in Techstars, and now I, I get to actually kind of approach some of those guys as, as a peer instead of just as a mentee. But um, all along the way, I think you'll find a, a lot of people that are willing to pay it forward. Um, my advice, the, the biggest piece of advice, I think, for, for mentorship is um, don't find, find those people that are willing to, to, to pay it forward as opposed to the ones that ask for, for something. Right. Um, if, if somebody asks you for equity for, for being a mentor, then um, I think, it, in my opinion, maybe misaligned, uh, misaligned uh, ideas there. Right. If they if they provide value and you give them equity, that's one thing. But if they're looking for equity um, for mentorship, that's I, I feel like that's that's a different thing. Um, and and you know, show them that you care. Right. When when somebody gives you advice, when somebody gives you, um, uh, you know, th their time. Um, Either act on it or, or explain to them why you didn't. Don't just, you know, a friend of mine, uh, CEO of Full Contact, uses this term. It's called grin fucking. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, where, where he, you know, you smile, you, you, you say yeah, but, th but then you, you ignore it, right? So um, don't actually, actually either act on it or explain why you didn't um, it, so that they feel like their time went into something. There's nothing I hate more than spending a half hour, hour of my day with somebody and then they come back and, and nothing's changed in two, three months, right? And, and for no reason. Um, that, that just feels like I, I wasted my time. Actually, I wanted to follow up on that one. But so, um, so 
did you give advisory shares to your advisors? I did. I did. After after we we talked to a lot of different advisors. After we we found that the select few that. Um, after a you know a month or two, we found that we were we hit a good cadence. Um, then we we gave out advisory shares that that vested. Make sure just like employee options vest, uh, make sure that um, advisor shares vest. And and we've canceled some of them after a year where they were vesting over two years, and we we're like, all right, well, we're kind of not using you anymore in that way. Uh, we want the second half of the, so the shares back. So what's a good like a point or half a point? What's a good it depends on how early you are. Again, it, it depends on the upside uh, potential. Anywhere, I think, from you know, 10 basis points to a half a point is, is kind of, I think, the range. And then the other question is also, you know, that's the first thank you. But second thank you is, do you invite them to participate in the round? I, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a great vote of confidence from, from them. Um, I, that would make me feel a lot more comfortable in, in giving somebody equity is that if they actually wanted to put their own money behind you, then that, that, that says a lot. Um, it, I, I would absolutely always allow, you know, advisors or people, you know, angels in, into the round that I, I leverage. I want the, inve the investors to believe in me and, and an advisor clearly does. Okay. Uh, one last question, and this is probably the most important question we always ask. Start Brian. Uh, ready? Yeah. So, who is your favorite superhero? Um, so I, I think my favorite superhero, which is a question I've, I've, I don't think I've ever answered before. So well done there, Brian, on <laughs> on a first. Um, I, I'd say Wolverine. Right? He's um, you just you can cut him up, you can you can stab him, you can do whatever. He just gets back up and, and kind of you know heals and, and keeps going. Um, I feel uh, that that resonates with me. I feel like he, he, you know, he's not indestructible, but, but at the same time, and, and he's, you know, he's human. He, he takes pain, but he, he just kind of powers through it. Done. Yeah, he powers through it. Cool. So, do you, uh, do you do, do you do trick or treat during Halloween? I, I don't anymore. I don't. <laughs> you will be. Because I got you. <laughs> 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 That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you for coming out.